Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Rethinking Compensation, Ensuring Equitable Strategies After One-Time Funds Run Out with our partners here at Charter Impact and ACE Charter. Um, as we are settling into the space, um, please go ahead and introduce yourself um, in the chat. We've got um, a fun bonus question as well. So if you could just share your pronouns, your titles, and where you're located, so city or state, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, and the bonus question is, what was your favorite high school extracurricular activity? Um, so real quick, my name is Dane Castillo. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and I am here with Agility. I'm the marketing associate. And I'll also be kind of your webinar support today. So um, as we go through this webinar, if you've been here with us before, you know uh, we love to hear from you. So please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A or in the chat box. Um, if we can't get to them in real time, uh, we'll keep track of them and do our best to answer them during Q&A at the very end of this session. Um, and then the other note is that we will be recording this um, and we're going to send you all an email later with this recording and um, any follow up information as well. Awesome seeing more people come in here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're excited to share the space with you. Awesome, we got some favorite extracurriculars, dance. All right, football, art, love it. All right, friends, we're going to get started here in just a few moments, but if you are just joining us, please go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat so we know who you are, where you're from, um, and uh, your favorite high school extracurricular activity. Love hearing about what everyone's favorite activity was. <laughs> Listening to music, art, love it, yeah. <laughs> um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and get started. And just remember, we are recording this. Um, we will have time for Q&A at the end. But if you do have to hop, um, just keep an eye out on your email and we'll send you an email follow up with the recording and any additional information that we share in this webinar. Um, but yeah, I think I'm going to go ahead and kick it off to Nina to get us started. Thanks, Dane, and thanks so much to everybody who's joined and for sharing in the chat. It's really awesome to see the variety of favorite high school extracurriculars and to know who's on the call and to see the variety of places that, that people are joining from. And we're excited for today to be really interactive, so please feel free to share your questions in the chat. There will be time, definitely time for Q&A at the end. So we are gonna start just by introducing ourselves so you know a little bit about us. So my name is Nina Batia, and I come to this work at Agility Consulting having, having spent my career in education. So I have been a teacher, I've been a founding principal, I've worked as an educational coach and I've worked in education nonprofits throughout my career. I've also had the privilege of being a coach to Kennedy, um, who is also going to be one of our panelists today. And so I'd love for him to introduce himself as well. Great. Thank you, Nina. My name is Kennedy Ladio, uh, pronouns he, him, his. And I'm the CEO for ACE in San Jose. I've been in the educational space for 22 years and had the privilege of managing schools in California and Massachusetts. And then, uh, hi everyone, I'm Jason Sidmer. I'm Managing Director at Charter Impact, uh, he, him, his as well. Um, and Charter Impact, we are a back office financial service provider, um, primarily uh, with schools in California as well as a couple of schools in Arizona and uh, Nevada now. And um, we do uh, soup to nuts, uh, uh, back office services from payroll, AP accounting, and then your fractional CFO role. I manage the team of fractional CFOs. Um, we also have a data team and uh, uh, have a number of offerings and services that we can provide. Um, one of my colleagues is gonna drop 
if anyone is interested to meet with us in the chat, uh, some opportunities to book some time. Um, but with that, uh, I'll pass it back to uh, Nina. Thanks, Jason. So just a little more context on agility and the work that we do. So all of our work at Agility focuses around equity and making sure that organizations and schools and CMOs are set up for success around being more equitable in their talent practices. And so that includes closing wage gaps, closing opportunity gaps, and making sure that we have really diverse leaders um, at sitting at the forefront of organizations as well. Um, so our services include placing leaders. So Kennedy was actually, has been a, a leader for two of our searches. Um, and then we also work to close wage gaps through the compensation services that we offer. So we do compensation studies for schools and as well as for nonprofit organizations. And then we also reimagine talent systems. So this includes thinking about building competency models, thinking about performance management design, um, um, strategic planning, organizational systems, really anything that you can think around related to how can organizations um, be more equitable across, across their systems. And we've supported a number of clients um, in, in the education space. So you can see here, uh, this is just, this isn't a comprehensive list of, of every client that we've supported, um, but just a, a sample of, of some of the clients that we've supported. And on our website, you can see a full list. So um, in terms of our agenda for today, we do wanna hear from you as we get started. And so Dane is gonna launch a poll because we're curious as you joined us today to know what um, some of the, in, in terms of the challenges that you're facing, what is the biggest challenge that you're facing? And um, when I shared this question with Kennedy, Kennedy had a really interesting response. So Kennedy, would you mind sharing what your thoughts were when you saw this question? Uh, yeah, for me, it was just difficult to choose because um, you know, I think I likened it to like getting ready for a field trip, you know, get, getting your car ready. And then somebody says, you know, what's, uh, what, what's more important, you know, to have a tank full of gas or to have all your tires properly inflated, right? Like the answer for me is all of them. Uh, I can't do, we can't do this work without, um, you know, address having solutions for each one of these. Exactly. So we recognize, thank you, Kennedy, for sharing that. It's so true. Um, as a former school leader, I fully appreciate that um, we're asking you here to choose one and we recognize that that all of these are important, but are curious to know from your perspective right now, what's really most top of mind, knowing that they're all really important as we dive into this content today. So appreciate you all taking the time to, to share your input here at the beginning. And Dane, have we had a good amount of responses? Do you think we can close and share? All right. So it looks like, um, and this is very similar. We put this poll on LinkedIn as well. Um, and it looks like we saw a similar. So what I can tell you what's similar and what's different from what we saw on LinkedIn. What's similar is that um, teacher pipeline and retention is the top response. We saw that on LinkedIn as well. Um, what's a little different here is that budget came in at number two, um, and what we saw on LinkedIn was that student enrollment came in second, um, but again, knowing that those are very much linked, so can appreciate that. Um, and then here, student enrollment came in um, third, and then someone chose other, so feel free to share with us in the chat what else is top of mind for you. So it, today's session is going to very much cover thinking about teacher pipeline and retention is a challenge and how can you address that? And then also thinking about budget, which a lot of you clearly, that's a, that's a concern and challenge you're thinking about as well. And so I'm excited to pass it to Jason to share a perspective around um, given one-time funding sources that are running out, how can schools and CMOs be thinking about um, budget in the, this year and in years to come? Thanks, Nina. So uh, Charter Impact, 90% of our business is in California. And looking at everyone introduce themselves in the chat, it does feel like uh, there are quite a few people 
from California. But I think uh, looking at this holistically for the nation, you may see similar trends in other states. And what we find here for California specifically, but hopefully applicable elsewhere, is 2021 fiscal year, uh, the state gave absolutely no COLA. The pandemic had just hit us and they didn't know what was going to happen. And then you saw the biggest COLA uh, ever in state funding. Uh, so the cost of living increase jumped up from zero to 5%. And then the following year, almost two and a half times or more than two and a half times that to over 13%. And it's come a little bit back down to reality, but still the second highest all time in California history, 8.22% uh, this current year. But moving forward, we're not going to see that. Um, moving forward, next year's projected at back to real levels of sub 4% and looking even further outward, 3.3 uh, or less uh, moving forward. And so if you've been giving these large cost of living increases to your staff and they're gonna have this expectation of five to eight to 10% year over year, it's just not the reality. And also doing something like that may be detriment detrimental to your budget in the long term uh, as we continue on here. So just overall looking at the state budget, um, Last year's state budget, fiscal year 22-23, uh, the approved budget was nearly $308 billion for the state of California. And then when it was proposed for 23-24, it was the first time uh, in the past six years that the proposal was less than the prior year. Uh, how it actually shook out, because the impending recession hasn't come or is not coming, uh, the approved budget is higher year over year, but just minorly. And so definitely not in line with the actual cost of living increases here, um, but uh, with with the increase or flattening of what, what next year looks like may actually be a decrease or may continue this flat trend. So you need to stretch your money further. So in California, there were a lot of one-time money dropped in some of this federal, a lot of it state. So going back to fiscal year 21, uh, you got all of your gear and ESSER funding that was added in. And so this is really a timeline for California of nearly $44 billion that was allocated as one-time funds uh, into everyone's budget. And hopefully it hasn't created this reliance or dependency uh, because it does look like the well for the one-time funding is dropping out. And we saw that with this year's budget. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So the arts, music, and learning recovery funds they were approved last year, and this year the uh, governor, the the approved budget actually pulled back one point eight billion dollars that they had previously approved and given to schools. So they're robbing Peter to pay Paul here. They balanced their budget by taking money they had already given, and so you know, this reliance, if it's going to also be reduced, uh, is going to create a hardship if if you are dependent on that money. And uh, additionally, no new one-time money was approved this year. So as you can see on the chart here, just again, reiterating how much in one-time funding, so not just the giant COLA increases, but all this one-time funding being dropped in. And now this current year, one-time funding was actually reduced by 1.7 billion. And so I mentioned earlier, you know, What's happened in the past is in the past, right? But this is sort of your game plan and planning. If you gave reasonable yet higher than normal COLA increases, uh, which is the bottom chart or the top chart, you actually gave cost of living increases to your staff, uh, which then the increases are in perpetuity. If you're reliant on those one-time funds, once they run out, once you've used them up, uh, your situation could look very dire here in the top chart. Whereas if you gave nice 8% last year, 5% this year, and the below chart is an actual school that is our client, and they're in steady footing to have a surplus uh, maintained even after they've utilized all that one-time funding. Next slide. So with uh, thinking about this, if you're not doing it already, 
proper planning is really going to be the key here. So again, this is the school that we saw on the other page. Uh, you can see that realistically, they're going to stretch their money out all the way to fiscal year 27-28, uh, which is when the Learning Recovery Emergency Block Grant is going to expire. But by having a tracker, having a plan in place, making it gradual so that you're not so reliant that you're not paying teacher salary, you're finding one-time incremental items, or you're finding positions that you can close through attrition year over year. Uh, this proper planning is going to help ensure the long-term uh, viability and sustainability of your school. And then uh, was not a key element, but always wanna to touch on uh, the enrollment trend. So this is California's enrollment trend uh, projected through the next uh, uh, almost decade. So if you know that students are leaving the state um, or families are leaving or there's less kids in the pot for whatever reason, uh, that's also another thing to consider. So if you're projecting, you know, 5% growth in your school, because that's what it experienced from 2018 to 2022, uh, maybe it's time to, to make it a flatline projection, make sure you're sustainable there. Or if you've seen flatlining or declining, um, how can you sort of plug that the the leaky faucet or maintain um, so you can keep the status quo? So uh, with that, um, you know, I threw a lot of uh, financial information at you. Let me uh, pass it over to Kennedy uh, to give his real world. Oh, sorry. And then my apologies. So here's just some thoughts on managing the loan enrollment is to assume that these declines are going to be permanent um, and then uh, consider uh, remote options. So this might also uh, tie in if you still have an independent study IS program. Um, could you hire a teacher outside of the state? Are there remote options? Can you give flexible work days um, that is going to give you those added benefits or benefits to your staff? And uh, really just thinking outside of the box on how you can manage uh, this trend uh, to differentiate uh, your program, your school, your staff, and uh, and help uh, alleviate the stress that this could put on your program. And my apologies, one slide too early, but uh, let me pass it over to uh, Kennedy, who uh, is actual feet on the ground, not just uh, looking at spreadsheets. <laughs> um, thank you, Jason. So you want me to answer the question in terms of like how to deal with a financial cliff? Yeah, I think uh, if you can talk about um, how uh, how you're preparing for it, what your planning looks like, and uh, and what you've been doing proactively. Okay. Uh, yeah. So for us, I mean, it's really a, a it's a two part um, equation. So you're looking, you know, you just uh, really talk really well about the financial piece, but then you also have the people piece, right? That what I always like to refer as the EQ. Um, part of the equation. So for the financial piece, um, I think the key for dealing with this financial cliff that we've all talked about for a period of time and we knew it was coming, uh, I think uh, it's it really for us is starting early. So we started last year. Um, and one of the things uh, before I even go into the solution is uh, a, a good mentor of mine, uh, Superintendent Londell, retired now, uh, Joe Condon, he always told me, you don't put one-time money into things that eat. Right. And unfortunately, at A's, we actually made that mistake and we just increased our 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 staff a lot. And now when we're looking at the end of this cliff and it's here, uh, you know, the challenge is how do you downsize and how do you do it in a way that honors people and respect and respect people? Uh, so for us, we started last year uh, and we led a lot of the um, positions as they vacated. We just would not refill them. Um, and so for us, we had like a four million dollar cliff when we looked at all these one time money. And we were able to really downsize, uh, take a chunk of uh, 2.4 million in, in one year with all that proper planning and letting folks uh, and just not filling the positions that, that were vacated. And we started really to let um, people know ahead of time, um, hey, this position is, is um, filled by one time money. So we want to make sure that you're prepared, you know, for the coming years. And so I think honoring people and respecting them by giving them enough time, being transparent with them, 
uh, it's one way, you know, it was a really crucial step for us to be able to downsize the organization by about 29 FTE and not cause a lot of chaos, right? Um, I think the, the the second piece is this year where we're still looking at a, a million and a half dollars to downsize. And, and we're looking at the staffing going, hmm, we're at a point where it's like, okay, we have minimum staffing um, and we need, uh, we need the minimum staff required to deliver a quality program to our students because that's what they deserve. Um, so at that point, then you turn to the other, the other lever, which is enrollment. And as you, as you clearly noted, Jason, enrollment has been sloping downward, not even flat or upwards, right? Um, so for us is, we know, we created a, a community, community engagement team uh, just to go out there and start building relationships with the community, getting our name out there. There's nothing better than word of mouth is what we found in Charter. Um, and, and so that's one piece. But now we also realize since we have middle schools and high school, that the high school enrollment, so recruiting and doing marketing and getting an enrollment uh, from the outside is hard, right? That's difficult. We all know that. But if you have a, a middle school, middle schools that feed your high school, well, you should have a cap, a captive audience. And for us, uh, we, it's realizing how can we maximize the percentage of middle schoolers that go to our high school. For us, we we had a, a really um, big opportunity. We didn't have a large percentage. Uh, we found that as we grew the middle schools, um, our program you typically for with um, when you have networks as you grow, your you have to balance that quality. And so we found that we had we had a really good opportunity here. So we put together a team from all the middle schools and the high school, and we're saying, how can we create better relationship between our eighth graders and our high school staff and students? And so it's creating a like calendar of events where we get our students to go and visit the high schools, engage, be in the, we found that high schoolers like people, we like to, we can't really, it's not, it's not as effective to have somebody come to you and talk to you about, what a great high school you have over here. It's better for you to go and experience that yourself. And so you build those relationships in the, in the natural habitat of the high school. That gets young students, middle schoolers more engaged. Um, so, we're, so, so we're doing that this year with the hope that at least we can start to increase the enrollment on the high school and stop the decline. And the middle school, we're still going door knocking, you know, um, every, every evening. And that's still like kind of um, guerrilla tactics. Um, and then finally, the, the, four, the fourth solution for us in terms of managing the financial cliff is continue to look for these one-time money. So the bonanza, as you said, is, is, is pretty much um, done after this year, unless we get some more pleasant surprises, which, you know, um, we may. Uh, but for us, you know, there's still a, a lot of charter schools found that the ERC, the Employee uh, Retention Credit uh, Tax Money, was a, is a, was a big pot of money especially for larger networks. And so for us, we're looking at that um, and looking at the, you know, whether the pros and cons and the risk to come associated, and then looking at that and being a lot smarter about how do we spend the one-time fund, if we capture that, how do we use it to shore up our, our network in the long term and, and not just pour it into, into people. Um, so that's kind of like the, the four levers that we're looking at for the financial piece. Um, the second piece, the people piece, um, it's really, you know, we're all in the business here of educating students, but we're also in the business of of uh, stewarding the lives of of older o older of adults, right? And so we want to take care of that. They're not just our asset; they're our partners. Um, so for us, is really the way we manage that is that we're transparency. I mean, the bottom line for me is I am very transparent, and there's a risk to that, but I rather deal with the risk of being transparent than the risk of not being transparent. You can't build relationships and credibility and loyalty without being transparent, without being a little bit vulnerable or a lot vulnerable with your staff. Um, so we are, we, we talk to the leadership, we talk to the staff, uh, uh, we go to the staff meetings and we're just very honest. And then in, in terms of transparency, we also solicit input. Um, the other piece we recognize um, is that now we are being asked, we're asking people to do more with less. So for the teachers, it's really recognizing what does that mean for them? Well, it really means, if we're going to be honest, is that they're taking on more work, more stress. And so the key is, how do you really help them without just giving them a lot of platitude? And for me, what I find is, in addition to transparency, 
the teacher voice is a big thing. And figuring out what, how to give your teacher's voice in your organization, I think is really the challenge of, 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 our, of us, the leaders. Um, so for me, it means that I need to understand what are the critical issues they're facing day to day. And that is really um, challenges with students, with discipline, with classroom management, uh, with maybe conflict, with parents, with colleagues, right? And so how do I help them day to day? One of the things I, find out, I found out is that you create protocols and you create systems and policies so that you can um, have a support network for them before, things, before the challenges appear. But the key is not to make it top down. And as I was corrected, um, you know, one of the teachers in, did not like that terminology because it implies that somehow the CMO or there's people out there that are on top or better than the schools or the teachers. Um, so it really is more of a circle. So as a team, how do we get the voice of the, you know, the teachers? So how do we get them in and get their voice in creating solutions for those policies and those procedures? Because they know better than anyone else what's needed, what works and what doesn't work. So coming together and going to the staff meetings and make, you know, spending the time required to really hammer out a solution together um, is how you is how we find that we honor our teachers and our staff. Um, so for me, again, that that's um, in addition to that, I also we also make sure that we not just that we don't take advantage of our teacher in terms of the passion they have for our students, right? And, and the educators are here because they're passionate people. And I think that they can easily be taken advantage of. And I think that's a lot of reasons you have unions, right? Um, and so we make sure that we show up front that respect that we say, okay, if we're asking you to volunteer, if we're not gonna ask you to volunteer, well, if we're gonna ask you to volunteer to do something, it's gonna be compensated. So if you're going to work after school, if you're going to be a coach, if you're going to lead a leadership role, we're going to provide a stipend. We're going to ask you what kind of professional development you think you need. So in addition to MTSS and GLAD and SEL, what else do you think you need? Uh, and we're going to try to promote, you know, uh, community, uh, working communities, uh, learning communities where teachers are teaching and helping themselves. Um, so I believe that that piece, that the second piece, the EQ of the equation is just as important as finding a long term solution to the financial cliff or any of the other challenges, whether it be a teacher, you know, shortage um, or, or student under enrollment. Thank you so much, Kennedy. Um, I know as someone who's been a leader that everything you shared resonated. Um, I am sure that everybody who is on this webinar that your words resonated so much and I imagine that folks have follow are going to have follow-up questions for you and so I'm excited for us to continue to engage in in dialogue together um, and what you shared is a perfect uh, tee up for some of the strategies that I wanted to share related to this challenge around teacher retention and teacher pipeline. And how do we ensure that we keep our teachers, especially if we know that compensation may be a challenge, especially if we are seeing neighborhood school districts paying really high salaries, what can we do? Um, and Kennedy just hit on one of the most important strategies, which is leveraging voice and leveraging perspective. So one of the things that we do at Agility is we support organizations and schools in developing a compensation philosophy. And whenever we, we engage in any process, we always center the voices of the people involved in that school or in that organization. And so in building a compensation philosophy, we're going to ground that in your school's values. Um, and we're going to make sure as we're engaging in that process that we're centering the voices of your teachers and your staff so that we make sure we're hearing what's most important to them. What's gonna make them attract, be attracted to the organization and what's gonna make them want to stay? What are your people's perspectives on what's keeping them at your school and what may potentially make them want to leave? And how can we embed that in a philosophy that can be used as really a North Star, a guiding light, in helping um, your school to really attract and retain top talent. Because as Kennedy was saying, and this is such a key point of equity, transparency is so important. 
So the more transparent you can be about a compensation philosophy, a or even an, we also work with organizations on an overall talent philosophy. So thinking about that entire, the entire spectrum across talent as well, even more broader than compensation. Uh, the more clear you can be on what your philosophy is and what your values are and centering the voices of your people in that process the more likely you, you are to be clearer on what your retention strategy is gonna be as a result. So that's, that's one of the services that we offer as well. In addition to that, another way that you can really center the voices of your people and, and keep tabs on how to make sure that you're really attracting and retaining your people is by collecting data. So I think about, you know, we know, I know everybody on this call who's involved in schools knows the importance of ongoing assessment. We would never get to the end of the year and to and to the end of year assessments and just say, okay, you know, good luck kids, <laughs> hope you do well, because we would be keeping tabs throughout the year. We would have done interim assessments. We would have done week, week, weekly quizzes. We would have done um, daily exit tickets to make sure that we're monitoring student performance. But somehow when it comes to thinking about adults and keeping a pulse check on how, how the adults in our building are doing, we don't necessarily think about keeping a pulse in the same way. So one of the things that we offer at Agility is something we call our talent um, equity assessment, which what it does is it spans the continuum all the way from how do you attract your team and your staff all the way to how do you reward them? And it, again, gives your staff, your entire team voice to give you perspective on how they're experiencing your culture. And, and what are your strengths and what are your pain points? And I think what can be particularly valuable is it will give you the, the overall picture, but then we will also disaggregate that data for you and show you, are you having any particular challenges across subpopulations so that you can hone in as needed and make sure that you don't have any unintended inequities that you may not wanna be perpetuating. Um, are you having, for instance, any challenges maybe more with managers than you are with non-managers or vice versa, for instance? Um, so these are the categories that we assess across. We think about, you know, how are you attracting your team? How are you engaging them and growing them? And then how are you making sure that everyone's being held accountable across the board and rewarding them as well? So this is another way to really think about um, ensuring that you are keeping your staff by doing pulse checks along the way. Um, and by doing it in survey form, you know, I think it's so important what Kennedy talked about this EQ piece and in having conversations, the relationships are really important, but sometimes, um, and again, as a former leader, I know this firsthand, there are times when if I had gone up to a teacher or staff member and asked for feedback, they wouldn't have said things to me directly, but they would say things on an anonymous survey um, because they felt safer there. So that can be the benefit sometimes of offering something via a survey because people will feel a little safer offering the feedback that way. So you'll get a little more of that unfiltered feedback, which can be really valuable data for you as well. Another retention strategy is thinking about how can you build your own pipeline? What are the strategies that you can use? And again, leveraging the, the wisdom of, and the resources within the current talent that you have, um, the current amazing team that you have to think about how can you continue to build on that team? Um, and, and I was at a recent charter school conference and I also heard a really great strategy of how this, this team uh, with their high school students, they were thinking intentionally of having to, how to grow their own students to come to graduate their high school, go to college, and then come back and teach, which I thought was another great example of how to build their own pipeline over the longer term. Um, so it's important here to think creatively about what are the strategies and, and, and strengths that your school offers, um, and how can you really build a pipeline and leverage those strengths um, based on what your charter is specifically offering? And then finally, the last thing to think about here when we, when we consider you know, the teacher pipeline and teacher retention as a strategy is 
again, thinking about transparency is career progression. And how clear are you in outlining for, for your teachers and your full team what career progression could look like? So one of the things that we offer at Agility is building out a scope of roles with real clarity, consistency, and transparency with what that career pathway can look like. Um, and the importance of this can be is that people can see, okay, wow, if I stay here, what could that career pathway be? And we know that, for instance, for teachers, it can be notorious that, you know, I'm going to be a teacher. This is all I can be. What does my career pathway look like? And I think that's one of the benefits that charters have is thinking creatively and, again, leveraging the wisdom of your team to say, what would you like it to look like? What could it be? And the wisdom within your team to ask that question and find out what some of the answers could be. What are some of the ways, what are some of the creative ways that, that potentially teachers could get additional leadership experience where they're not totally going out of the classroom, but potentially they're taking on some additional leadership responsibilities? Is that a possibility? Um, I think there's lots of ways to think about this, um, to think creatively so that you're really retaining your teachers. And again, not blowing your budget, but giving teachers stretch opportunities as well. So I'm going to pass it to Jason to share a, a few more ideas related to budget, and then really excited to open it up to Q&A. Thanks, Nina. So, you know, just food for thought here is understanding the true cost of what your your actions are, or if you are giving that 5% raise, what do those numbers really do to impact your budget? Just bring it full circle on how the financial ties into being respectful, thoughtful, and not putting yourself in a situation that's unsustainable. So here is a hypothetical with 25 teachers all making nearly the California minimum exempt rate. Uh, and if you gave that 5% raise, you're adding $100,000. Alternatively, if we go to the next slide, instead of the 100,000 in new expense, could you, add another staff member that won't total $100,000 that uh, isn't going to be in perpetuity that could be closed if there's natural attrition. Uh, by doing that, could you offer work from home one day a week? Could you um, think of ways that you can have a larger impact and uh, create a better working environment without it being compensatory? Can we offer professional development? Can we give different titles or different responsibilities that uh, creates a more robust uh, job satisfaction for an individual that you want to reward and recognize? Um, and so having the full frame picture of uh, money isn't the solution to everything. It can make things easier. But when we, we remove that from the equation, how can we still uh, achieve our same goals? And so with that, as a final thought before we uh, sort of dive into Q&As, uh, is a concept I like, which is uh, rocks, pebble, and sand. So going uh, top, uh, bottom to top here, if you think about your standard funding as your rocks, your, your rocks should be paid for or your expenses that are paid for by standard funding are the things that you cannot live without. And your pebbles uh, are the things that you're able to do because of this one-time funding. And the sand is just the nice to haves with anything that you have left over. If you put these into a jar in any order, they may not fit. But if you put those rocks in first, followed by the pebbles, you shake the jar up, and then you put in the sand, there's magically room for everything. Uh, I realize that's a simplistic view, uh, maybe unobtainable, Maybe you've already cut all the sand out of your budget. Maybe you're already having issues cutting the pebbles out as your one-time funding is depleted. Maybe you only have rocks left and that one-time funding is support helping to support the rocks, not just the standard funding. But just food for thought to really create that prioritization uh, system so you understand what are your musts, what are your wants, and what, you know, what are your, your true needs. And if you can't meet the true needs, um, how can you get to a place that that 
is sustainable. So you are hitting at least those bare minimums. Uh, with that, pass it back. Thanks, Jason. So we do have a, um, a worksheet that you can download. You can scan that QR code here and and um, and thanks. And Dane put a question in the chat, a prompt for you. What is coming up for you? It, are there any strategies that you've heard that really resonate? Feel free to share that. You can also, of course, share any questions because we're moving into Q and A. Um, the the compensation philosophy is worksheet is linked in the chat. You can also scan it here, and I'm going to pass it on. Hey, everyone. Um, before we head into our kind of Q&A period, which we have quite a bit of time for, so I hope y'all have some questions or comments to share. Um, I know we shared a lot of information here, and if you're sitting just, you know, absorbing, 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 that's totally fine, but please, we are here, and we'd love to answer your questions. So before we jump into that, we would love to know, um, you know, how, how we did, um, how helpful this was for you, um, so please go ahead and take our survey. I will grab the um, the link here and drop it in the chat for y'all. There we go. Or of course you can use your phone and scan the QR code however you'd like. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is we are, um, before we jump into this Q&A, we had already dropped in some information from Charter Impact. Thank you, Sam, um, about how to connect with us. Um, here's additional information on how to connect with us. Um, this information will also be in your follow-up email. Um, so don't worry about scanning that if you don't, if you can't. Um, but I think what we're going to do now is we're going to kick off into Q&A since we have some time. Um, so one of the questions that we're going to start with um, and while you're thinking about it, so you have a little time here, um, is what if I ask for feedback from teachers and staff to guide priorities and I get conflicting or differing perspectives? How do I move forward? Such a great question, y'all. <laughs> All right. Kennedy, I'm curious for your thoughts about that question. Can you hear me? Okay, so I, th I think I like to always be careful that we're not looking at a, at a false dichotomy, right? So if we get conflictive information, you know, is it really conflicting or, or is it really pointing us towards a more complex solution? So first I'd like to know, um, uh, you know, how many people share, share the opinion uh, to understand where people are. And then I would just bring it back to, you know, bring it back to the, to, to the group, to the teachers. Um, and and just get to know, dig a little more, a little deeper, and understand what uh, why are they why they appear to be conflicting, and really try to and if you use that information to come up with a solution that encompasses the different views, I think you're going to come up with a a better a solution that satisfies your uh, the general public more more. I love that answer. I would just layer on to one of the things we talk about um, to at Agility when we talk about equity is beware of the squeaky wheel. Um, so sometimes when we hear feedback, um, there can be a, sometimes a voice or a couple of voices that are just really good at making sure their perspective is heard. Um, so you want to make sure if there's conflicting perspectives, that it, is, is it really that you know your your team across the board is 50 50 or is it just that there's a, a, a faction or a couple of people that are just really good at making their voice heard so that's the other thing that i would just say from an equity perspective to to be mindful of yes and may i add to that uh, so for me in addition is when you listen to that loud voice you definitely want to make sure that they're not just a loud a voice in the room but you want that's the those are the voices sometimes that are challenging you, and it's and I find sometimes that it's really easy for me to shut off and say you know what uh, they're not in touch with the reality they don't understand the financial implications they don't understand this or that, but it's really a challenge to to me to uh, to the senior administrators to figure out what are they really why why do they hold that opinion it's really uncomfortable so it's it's pushing us to go beyond our boundaries. 
And then sometimes when we dig into that, I find that um, it put it helps me or the organization evolve to the higher level where we're we're just not we're not being constrained by what we think are the financial implications, and we're looking more broader at the human pieces of why they're pushing. Um, so sometimes I really value that loud voice or the courageous voice, as I like to say it. And sometimes they could be turned, they, they could be called the rebel rousers and the troublemakers. But it's our job to really listen to them. Love that. Thank you, Kennedy and Nina. Um, we have another kind of follow up question to that. Um, if if you're starting out on surveying your staff. Um, what sort of questions would you ask and how often would you um, do the survey? So, um, so like, what are the key kind of the key questions that you would kick off um, the survey process with? Uh, for, for us, we really look at, uh, we go back to like, what are we trying, what's our mission? What are we trying to achieve? So we center it around their student. Um, so what it, every organization has a different mission on how they go about educating the child and creating lifelong, lifelong learners. Um, so we try to make sure that we look at every step of that, whether it be in ELA or whatever subject it is, you know, math, science, chemistry. Um, and we try to ask, so we, we look at that and we try to find out um, how, what do you think, how you think we're serving in these particular areas? Um, how are we doing in the social emotional learning? Um, how are we doing in the relation, building relationship with the students, building relationships with, with, with colleagues, with the parents? Um, so I, I really, t uh, try to find out, you know, all the key levers in that child's education and get the, the teacher's perspective or the staff on how they perceive we're doing. And then what do they think we're missing? Um, I mean, that's just one approach. I would, I agree. So I think it's so important, right? We, I think Kennedy named this earlier and this is so important. Uh, you know, schools are there to serve, to serve students. Students are at the heart of everything. And I remember a mentor, when I was a school leader, a mentor of mine telling me, and you have to remember as a leader, your job now is to take care of the teachers and the staff because they are the ones taking care of the students. And so I would add, I'd say yes and to what Kennedy shared and layer on that um, to think about it in a couple of ways. So how can you survey staff um, where you're again getting some kind of anonymous feedback so staff feel a way to give feedback in a way that's really safe and that you're doing some kind of either focus groups or one-on-one -on -one interviews, depending on the size of your team, um, so that you're getting a sense of staff experience as well. Um, and that you're asking about, uh, just given the focus on retention right now, we just keep hearing this over and over again, what a challenge retention is, what's gonna keep your team at your school? That would be, that would be the number one thing I would be asking about is, is what do you love about being here and and what would what would what would keep you here and what would be a reason for leaving and how could I prevent that from happening or what could I do to to make sure that you stay awesome. thank and, you both uh I'll I'll try to yeah. jump in with some finances here no and uh, I know that there's an additional question in the the chat so I'll try to address that as well um you know, I think there's an authenticity piece here that's really important. So the question in the chat is around going on a, a listening tour and you need to be prepared to act. Um, soliciting feedback with, with no action, you know, is going to uh, eventually lose your credibility with your staff. And uh, what that action looks like can be very different. So budgetarily, um, if you are projected at a hundred thousand dollar deficit for the year and you want to end your year balanced uh if you take action two months into the year it's much more obtainable to cut ten thousand dollars from your budget over 10 months if you wait to take action in may then you've got two months so it's a fifty thousand dollar cut in two months and so it just compounds um with that you know the, the listening tour and taking action can be very different. Again, uh, financially focused on my end, but I recently um, hosted a town hall or not 
hosted, but I joined a school's town hall for their back to school and went through their budget, went through uh, what the 8% COLA really means funding wise for that school and that it, it can't translate straight into uh, into raises because of all the factors that have been discussed earlier, that the one-time funding is dropped out, that when that one-time funding is fully gone, this in perpetuity is unsustainable, that it will actually lead to job loss in the future and might actually cause the school to close if they took that path. And so it's making the hard decisions based on uh, what you're hearing and being authentic with your staff. Um, can may I add to that? Uh, just yeah, in, go ahead. Because that that is that is just so key what you just said in terms of um, making making sure that that, that you go around um, and the authenticity piece. So part of uh, part of what I like to do is is make sure that we sort the results because you're going to get a lot of results. You go back to them and you ask the staff, please help me sort. We there's a there's a gazillion thing for us to address. Help me sort them out so you get agreement. It's not you saying. This is what we think the top one are, right? It's it's the staff saying this is what what we think is more the most important, and then you communicate a timeline on and a process on how you're going to go about uh, creating a solution and who you're going to involve because it's not it's not top down bottom up is you know together as a team so they understand what what role they're going to play and when and then you follow through because I think a lot of times we go on the listening tours. We get overwhelmed or what with everything coming at us. And then we selectively deliver pieces. And sometimes we don't even go back to the audience, the original audience. Uh, we may do it through email or other venues, but it's going back to those staff meetings and having that, you know, that town hall feeling where you're going back and saying, this is what you guys said. This, this is how we worked it out. And, and here it is. Um, that is how, so I really appreciate you saying, uh, highlighting that, Jason. Awesome. Um, I think that kind of touched a little bit on um, our next question, which was about involving the community um, in that process. Um, so the other question we have is when you, this is a common question that we have. Um, we see a lot of like people who are, are dealing with kind of staffing issues um, so this one is like, if I'm understaffed at the leadership level, like, what do I prioritize? It's a lot. <laughs> Can you say a little more like, what do you mean by what do I prioritize? So like in relationship to um, these uh, taking, doing the listening tours and moving through them to action, um, how do you know like what to prioritize? Oh, okay. So if we've done the listening tour, we come up in the, with agreement of what the top three are is figuring out which one should be and which one you can act on. Um, for me, I would prioritize the things that have a direct effect on the staff in the day to day. So again, going back to the teacher, the teacher care, they don't really care what happens at the CMO across the street, or they care about, they have the most important job and that is dealing, educating with a child. That's the most valuable asset. And so how do you help them on the day to day when they have an issue, when they have, again, classroom management, discipline, peer, uh, peer relationships, parent relationships, uh, resources for the classrooms, um, you know, that's what they care about. So anything that prioritizes the teacher's effectiveness with the student on day to day is what I would, because that's going to have your largest impact. Um, I agree. I would just add to that too, like, really having a strategic focus. So Kennedy just gave a great example. When when you're understaffed, rather than trying to do it all or trying to have a focus on, you know, that's that's uh, uh, very broad, try to say, okay, I'm really going to have to go deep here. And, and here's why I'm going to be strategic um, because that's going to get you way more leverage. Fantastic. Thank you all. Um, I haven't seen any other questions come in, but we do have a, just a couple minutes here. So if anyone has a last minute question, um, you can go ahead and drop it in the Q&A or use the raise hand function um, and we can get it in. Otherwise, we um, can wrap this up if unless you all have anything else you want to share. Well, I just want to say thank you for the folks that um, logged in because uh, this is a time 
where the community are black and brown children need us the most. Um, and the fact that you're going out there, the fact that you acknowledge that we don't have the answer in any not any one of us, but collectively we can help each other figure out the answer. Um, and so, you know, going out and, and, and reaching out to webinars and, and other ways to increase your knowledge or, or your network um, is commendable um, because this, you know, we're, we're going to address, we're going to be successful together, not operating in islands. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. The power of community on this one. All right. Ooh, we have one last question here. Um, how have you been transparent and in what ways? Um, well, for for me, uh, I would say the way uh, the way I've been transparent is uh, really look, going into an organization and and um, seeing what it make assessing where the organization is at financially, academically, compliance wise, and just being transparent at the board. So the first thing I do is I bring in the board and I am completely transparent. So the good, the bad, and the ugly, and especially the ugly. Um, and let them know, but not just opinions, but with facts. So go in, do the research, do them, do a little bit of history, because folks don't want to be told just uh, you know what's what's good and bad, but also the why, and they want to have some data behind it. So I like to go historically, how long, uh, uh, you know, go back nine, ten years if you have that kind of history of academics, of finances, and then come up and assume best intentions, and then when you see the blips and the and the oops. You try to support that with, you know, with best intentions. But don't assume that at that time that decision might have been the right decision, um, and when everything's going good. And now no one is, no one had uh, could foresee the pandemic, could could foresee the, um, you know, the the mental wellness issues that we're facing now. Um, so the decisions of the past may not have been the best now in this environment. Um, so transparency with the board in, in that respect, and then also taking that down to each of the school sites with the leadership and with the staff. So first you start with the leadership, you bring them into the challenges, you let them see the data for themselves, you solicit their input on how to interpret the data. Um, and then you make sure that the teachers, you know, staff meetings, that you are very transparent. So I I take a lot of risk and I share a lot. And uh, sometimes folks are like, you sure you wanna share that? You're gonna create panic, you're gonna create chaos. I find that um, I don't do, it doesn't happen that way, that those are false. Um, fears. Um, what I end up doing is respecting people, treating teachers as equals, um, uh, uh, assuming the right thing, which is that they have the capacity to take good and bad information and react to it, and that they appreciate somebody coming to them with a fresh perspective of there's no spin here. This is where we are and how we're going to figure this out together because there are no super heroes here. We're all together uh, in this together, and we're going to figure out a solution um, as a team. Otherwise, um, we're not going to make the progress that we need to make for our students. So always being loyal to the student, making sure decisions are filtered through what benefits the student and the staff the, uh, first, um, and then just not being afraid to share, to, to be transparent and share bad news with your staff and your board and your administrators. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Kennedy. All right, y'all, I think we are at time. So thank you again for joining us today. And thank you to our wonderful presenters, Nina, Kennedy, and Jason. We just really appreciate all of your expertise on this. Um, look, Keep an eye out on your emails because uh, we are going to go ahead and send up a follow-up email with all of this information in it um, and ways to uh, connect with Nina and Jason as well. Um, so thank you all so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.